The word Hosanna means save us. Hosanna isn't synonymous with Alleluia as we often sometimes use it, a word that we have buried during the season of Lent. Because when the crowd shouted Hosanna at Jesus, they weren't heaping praise on him the way we often think they were. No, Hosanna was more of a political proclamation than a religious one. Hosanna, they were saying, save us from these Roman occupying forces that are stealing everything we have. Hosanna, save us, Jesus, from these politicians and puppet kings who are more interested in lining their own pockets than in serving the people. Hosanna, save us, Jesus, from being a second-rate nation and bring us back to being a player on the world stage. But as we will hear, it didn't quite turn out that way, not the way that people wanted. If that's what they are looking for, then Jesus wasn't their guy. And things got ugly when they put their hope and faith in Jesus and it didn't pan out. He didn't kick the Romans out. He didn't crown himself king and sit himself down on the palace throne to return Israel to his former glory. He didn't make the country great again, at least the way they wanted him to. Instead, he endured their suffering. He endured their insults. He endured their death. Over the course of seven days, Jesus' story became humanity's story. Our story became God's story. So today, as we transition from Jesus' entrance into the holy city with palm branches waving, to hearing in on his betrayal, to watching his arrest, listening in on his show trial, and witnessing his execution, we hear this story, and we might say in our hearts, Hosanna, save us, Jesus, from those times of our hopelessness. Hosanna, Save us, Jesus, from those moments when we feel lost and betrayed. Hosanna, save us, Jesus, from those times of defeat that make us feel like giving up. Hosanna, save us, Jesus, when the deaths of those whom we love overwhelm us. Hosanna, save us, Jesus, from the terror of our own deaths when our time comes. This Lutheran tradition of reading the entire Passion story on this Sunday, helps us begin this Holy Week with the words of Jesus' suffering and death in our ears. It's a, re a reminder of our own complicity in his death, which is the death of the whole world. It is the death of everything that lives and breathes. It is the death of everything that moves, visible and invisible. We call this the passion story. And the word passion doesn't just mean a strong feeling. Biblically, Passion means suffering. This passion story, this suffering story, is the joining of the world's suffering with God's suffering in the person of Jesus. So then together, we will have compassion, which means to suffer with, recognizing that God isn't immune to pain, but that God lives in the very heart of suffering and death, so that God will know exactly what human beings experience, that God will know precisely what it means for human beings to die. And this is the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with a cup after supper, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one among it could be who, could, who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, 
The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, but those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must be, become like the youngest and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers." And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied me three times that you know me. Peter said to them, when I said you, Jesus said to them, when I said you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, not a thing. He said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And for the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless, and indeed it was written about me is being fulfilled. And they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, it is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he reached this place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When Jesus got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief, and he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas Is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched the ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing them in a firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept kept insisting, Surely this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, The cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who was it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and the scribes, gathered together and they brought him to their council. And they said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, if I tell you, you will not believe. 
And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? Jesus said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they insisted and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout Judea, from Galilee, where he even began to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether a man was a Galilean, and he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction and sent him off to Herod, who himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had began wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned Jesus at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any charges against him. And neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I, therefore, will have him flogged and release him. Then then they all shouted together, Away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed him again, saying, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he asked them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then I will release him. But the crowd urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led Jesus away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, And among them were women who were beating their chests and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. Then they came to the place that is called the skull. They crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, God's chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. When all the crowds who had gathered here for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, through, though a member of the council, had agreed to, to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then they took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the beginning of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come from, with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned, prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment.